we think the University of Saskatchewan has the premier program in water in the world. That's because we combine biology and chemistry, we combine hydrology and toxicology, and really what we're about is risk assessment and decision making. Uh, the work we do relates to water quality and what we put in it, to agriculture, runoff of pesticides, nutrients, but, but also to climate change. As climate changes, the quantity changes, and when the quantity of water changes, that has effects on the quality of the water. Some of the current projects that we're involved in involve both wastewater treatment, which affects water quality, and drinking water treatment. So we right now standing next to Wascana Creek. And we are downstream of the city of Regina right now, right next to the wastewater treatment plant where the effluent is released into the creek. We are conducting right now a study that looks into the potential effects of emerging contaminants that are released through those effluents. So we see all those chemicals that will enter the wastewater treatment stream and most of them are not cleared through the system. So the question we ask is whether those chemicals that are released into those streams can have an impact on local wildlife. But also ultimately because we take our drinking water out of surface water bodies, not so much out of this part of Ascana Creek, but out of Buffalo Pound for example, we well, of course want to also answer the question whether there is anything that can end up in our drinking water ultimately that may have a secondary effect on humans. We are part of a study that's done in Ontario, in Quebec and in Saskatchewan where we look at multiple sites, different types of treatment plants. So Regina, for example, right now is upgrading because they have a very outdated treatment system. It means it's a lagoon system, the wastewater stream goes in, it gets screened, so all the particulates get screened out. Then it settles for a couple of days in the lagoon and then it's released back into the creek through a disinfectant, which is pretty much uh, the minimum you have to do and it's really antiquated. The idea here was to get a pre-picture and then a picture after they go online and see how good they are actually in upgrading that system. The one portion we do here, we, we look at the effects of those chemicals coming through the effluent on local fish populations. We also care about what those chemicals do to other species that have cultural or economic relevance. And we cannot really do animal studies with those species because some of them are endangered sturgeon, for example. So we need to have alternative approaches that allows us to make those translations to those species. So what we do is we, we use in vitro tissue explants. So what we can do is we can take a liver or a gonad or a tissue out of those animals we can put them in a culture plate, we can grow them for a couple of days and we can expose them to those chemicals. So now I want to see if I can make a prediction and we have seen that this actually works pretty well. So we have shown last year that we can make predictions for walleye for example and Lake Diefenbaker, how they respond and how the whole animal responds. Feather and the species we work with here. We have a mobile lab, we can do clean work in here. Samples have to be frozen, processed right away. So a live fish you cannot transport for two hours through the prairies to get to a laboratory. So lots of the chemicals we worry about have a very immediate effect on hormone titers, like if you reproduce humans as well, estrogens, we all know. But those change within an hour. So if I don't process that fish within an hour, I really have no way of making an objective assessment if there's an issue or not. This is just aquacom. So we'll take the fish, put it in, and it'll kind of calm it down. Um, won't be moving around, and then we'll be able to take the blood right from it. And then we'll transfer it inside where they'll take out uh, the liver, uh, the gonads will sex them, so if they're a male or a female, um, or a juvenile if they're immature. Uh, we'll take out the spleen as well as the brain, and then we'll also do the weights and the measurement um, to see how long they are, um, and then we'll also do the secondary sexual characteristic scoring. This is part of my uh, thesis work, uh, looking at the potential endocrine disrupting effects of the effluents coming from uh, this wastewater treatment plant on a native uh, fish species, the fathead minnow. Now on the drinking water side, where we're looking at the water quality that we drink, we have excess nutrients. Uh, some of that comes simply because we have very high levels of nutrients in our prairie soils. As we farm and as things run off into the water, that puts nutrients into the water and it causes something called hazardous algal blooms. At Lake Diefenbaker, what we were doing was making measurements 
uh, in the reservoir of organisms. These are algal cells or cyanobacteria, blue-green algae. These are the ones that release toxic uh, material that are liver carcinogens. They can cause liver cancer. Um, so the, the amount that grows is really a function of how much nutrients are there. And what we were able to do was use satellite information. Red is bad. The higher the red concentration is the greater intensity of chlorophyll, which we use as a measure of how much of the algae and uh, cyanobacteria that are in that algal bloom that's releasing all these toxicants. And what you can see is starting in July, things get worse, uh, per particularly up here in the Capel and Gardner arms. And in August, even more extensive through the whole reservoir uh, into September. And then by the time we get to October again, it's starting to cool down and the, the worst is, is over. So we put all this information into um, an equation, an algorithm that allows us to predict how bad things will get in the future if we add more nutrients and how much we would have to reduce the concentrations of nutrients to go back to conditions that existed before. The most recent project we've started is looking at all of those thousands of chemicals that occur uh, in the lake uh, and specifically looking at them from the headwaters up in Alberta following all of those streams down there so what pesticides, herbicides, other man-made chemicals are getting into the river there and are they getting this far down to Lake Diefenbaker and what happens uh, to them when they're in the lake. We can go out and collect a sample here and we can detect thousands of chemicals in each sample. A lot of them are at very low concentrations and not a problem, um, but a lot of them again are of natural origin. So it's a question of differentiating between the chemicals that are natural to the lake and the chemicals that are man-made uh, and that may be a concern. We just drop this down till we feel it touch the bottom. And then the rope will go like that. And then we just lift it up about a meter just to raise it up off the bottom and then we'll drop it and those jaws will dig down into the sediment like that and then this is just a little thing that closes the jaws uh, some chemicals have chlorine on them some of them have bromine um, and so it's the bromin brominated ones that we're interested in we know there's quite a few man-made brominated chemicals flame retardants are one that has got a lot of attention from people recently, but there's a lot of organisms produce uh, brominated compounds as well. So it's trying to differentiate between man-made brominated compounds uh, and natural brominated compounds. One of the most effective ways of getting rid of chemicals is sunlight. And that's a process called photolysis. Uh, and it's very active in water. Um, so photolysis and the presence of oxygen will break down a lot of those chemicals in the water. Some of them are resistant, some of them are very rapidly broken down. But here in Saskatchewan we've got the problem where it may be sunny but this lake is covered by ice for five months of the year. And so that then limits the opportunity for photolysis to happen. So we want to look at, the, at the, what's happening to the chemicals during that period as well. Our job as researchers is to try to look into the future, look into our crystal ball, and give the decision makers the information they need to make good decisions. Help them predict how it's going to be and prepare for it. If we're prepared, we can manage it.